Hi, I'm Adam Shepherd, And I'm Jane McCallion. And you're listening to the IT Pro Podcast. Now, the tech skills gap is never far out of the news, and STEM skills, especially technology and computing, have become an increasingly important part of the curriculum. Indeed, government policy in higher education is leaning hard towards STEM at the expense of humanities and the arts. It's also a continual focus for businesses seeking to upskill employees, with coding and data skills frequently seen as priorities for internal development. But is there a danger of tipping the balance too far in favour of hard science at the expense of softer skills? How can we ensure the training on offer to lifelong learners will produce professionals with a well-rounded set of transferable skills? Joining us to talk about this and more is Anthony Tassel, Head of EMEA at online training provider Coursera. Anthony, thanks for joining us. You're very welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. So, Anthony, Coursera has recently published its latest Global Skills Report. Can you tell us a little bit about the report and what it covers? Absolutely. So every year we publish what we call a Global Skills Index, which is part of the overall Global Skills Report. And this is really looking at the state of skills across a wide range of countries. So we look at the insights that we can glean from our platform data and research. And in this particular iteration of the report, that data is looking from uh, the first quarter of 2020 through to the first quarter of 2021. So pretty recent data and looks across about 77 million learners on our platform uh, who are a combination of individual uh, people looking at their own learning goals and representation through about 4,000 campuses, 2,000 businesses, and about 100 different government departments, typically working on workforce development projects. So it gives us a very uh, in-depth insight into what's happening in the world of skills, what people are focusing on, what are changes, what are the trends in the skills world. But it also gives us some insight into the relative skills, competencies, or proficiencies of different countries and across different domains. So we can look at, for example, the UK and see how does it compare perhaps globally or or with Europe. And this report is really intended to help government institutions, workforces, industry leaders to really better understand those skill trends and how they potentially can look at those in the light of their own organization and their own plans to use skills to drive either competitive advantage or better outcomes for citizens or students. Now, we've descended into hybrid working at a fairly rapid rate uh, last year, I think it's fair to say, but it looks like this is very much here to stay. According to your report, however, home workers have historically been less likely to receive promotions and bonuses and more likely to end up doing unpaid overtime. Now that I guess the majority of us are, you know, to a greater or lesser extent, home workers. Are these issues going to continue to be a problem for employees, do you think? I do think it's a challenge that is something that institutions and companies need to look at. Um, As you say, in the report, the evidence we've seen is that individuals over uh, 2017 to 2020, so this is quite a long time period, and most, again, this is reporting on data that is perhaps pre-pandemic. And of Mm -hmm. course, the pandemic may have created a shift in approach and policy. But if you look at the historical data, what we saw is that those who mainly work from home were about half as likely to be promoted as other workers, so if you like office-based workers. Similarly, that getting bonuses that those who work from home were around about 38% less likely to receive a bonus. And more overtime, unpaid overtime, Mm -hmm. was done by people working at home compared to office workers. Now, again, this was typically individuals that we've looked at data over a period of years, and we've seen this as a trend and a pattern. And perhaps in many of those scenarios, people working at home were more anomalous compared to an office-based culture. What we are seeing as a result of the pandemic, as people are emerging and going back into the world of work, that Obviously, all institutions had to embrace working from home. We had no choice in that. Um, And it's been done for a long time. And many have found that to be very successful. And of course, many workers actually like to have the opportunity to work, at least partially from home. Mm -hmm. There's a general expectation that the majority, certainly of the UK's biggest employers, will have a much more blended 
mix of home working and office working. It certainly won't be going back to as much full-time office working as we saw in the past. And so people working at home, or at least in part, if not in full, will be a much more common employee experience. And I suspect that is likely to drive people to consider how to manage a remote workforce more effectively. Now, in order to make sure that is doing it in the right way so that people are fairly rewarded and promoted and get bonuses and they're paid accordingly and have all the same opportunities for advancement and development as anybody in the office, that does require a different way of thinking and managing the workforce. And of course, that's fundamentally a set of skills underlie that. Mm. And there are human skills about how you actually work remote teams, how you manage diversity, how you manage inclusion, how you manage well-being and sense and, and challenges around not having direct um, access to employees. All those are skill sets at both the employee level and the management level. And there are, of course, different elements of how you actually engage in the sense of what are the platforms I use? What technology do I have to embrace? How does that affect my day-to-day -day working and operations? How do I work with more virtual teams and more cross-functional? All of this is a shift in both technology skills and the tense of how we actually do our work and the human skills in how we engage with people in that environment. Mm. And we are, certainly in the UK, lagging behind in having those business skills today to effectively enable us to embrace the real power that a more flexible working policy would bring. And if you look at some of those specifics, if you look at the general business skills, mm. you know, we, when we look at our report, we look at skill sets across about 108 countries. And so it's a relative score against those countries. So if you're the very top, if you're number one, you'd, you'd score 100%. And if you're 108, you'd be at 0%. The UK is around 29%. So it's pretty low in terms of that overall business skills proficiency. And some of the specific ones around HR and communication skills are lower than average. HR skills are only about 13% proficiency and 21% for communication skills. So you can see there's a quite a lot of work still to be done to be mm. building those skill sets to make sure that we are not in a situation where those working from home are disadvantaged in some way about career opportunity or fair reward. I wonder if you know, over that uh, initial period that we're looking at, 2017 to 2020, um, that there was an element of sort of out of sight, out of mind, or even that, well, they're working from home, so they don't need you know, X, Y, Z. Um, and that you know, the, the pandemic experience will have broken that down a little bit more and that people who are home workers, uh, whether that's five days a week for whatever, might be seen with equal value um, as their in-office colleagues? Yeah, I think that's a very fair hypothesis. I think it'll be interesting to see if that's proven um, out in the data as mm -hmm. we go into the next year or two and we see how that, that workplace evolves. Um, looking at it from my own company perspective at Coursera, you know, we are very much trying to embrace a sense of being remote first. And mm -hmm. really what we mean by that is, if you think about a typical meeting with lots of people on board, you would typically have that meeting in an office, in a, in a meeting room with a number of people around the table with you, and then there'd be some people dialed in. And now my experience of those kind of meetings is the people inside the meeting room have much more focus. They're the ones asking the questions. They're mm -hmm. the engaged. You're directly talking to them. You're not really talking to the people on the, on the phone lines or, or the mm -hmm. you know, the you know, the internet, it's very much uh, almost an afterthought. And so trying to move to a remote first culture where you're really making sure that people who are working at home are not the afterthought, but actually the first people you're trying to reach out to and you're mm. prioritizing them, that's really critical. And so that's, um, mm. that's a different way of thinking about how you work and how you evolve. And it is going to take some processes to make that happen. Yeah, that's um, something we actually covered in uh, one of our recent IT Pro panel features, uh, the CTO of Moonpig, uh, Peter Donlan, was saying that they are adopting a similar strategy where for kind of important meetings, they're either going to be entirely in person or entirely remote to avoid mm -hmm. that kind of situation where you've got effectively second class citizens <laughs> when you know people are participating remotely. Yes, yes. And of course, that's not the only element of it that's one part of it is how you run a mm. 
meeting with multiple people, but it's also about if you're not seeing people in the office and you're not seeing what they're doing day to day and you don't have the opportunity to walk past their desk and have those little check-ins and catch-ups and chats and mm. coffee room breaks, you're building a kind of connection with an employee through those impromptu moments that is very hard to replicate when someone works from home because everything has to be scheduled when you're working from home. You have to arrange a meeting mm. just to have a catch-up. It's hard for people to connect with social events and so on. So it's really having a a continual thinking about every element of the working from home experience and how that is not going to disadvantage those individuals in some way. And you're really embracing the flexibility that brings to still derive the best possible outcomes for your organization. And it is a very different set of skills. It's a very different way of managing people, a very different way of working cross-functionally and a very different way of engaging people. And there are a lot of additional things that you need to take into consideration around do people have the right setup at home? How is their well-being going to be managed? What resources they have access, access to? Are they in a secure situation? There's going to be a lot more transition of possibly confidential information from an office-based setup into people's homes. There's lots and lots of things to think through. And mm. all of that requires a different way of operating and working, which is, comes back again to having the appropriate skill sets to make that happen. And you talked about earlier on, of course, there's a lot of focus on STEM skills, STEM skills in isolation don't solve for what I think you described as soft skills. We, we tend to refer them as more human skills because I think sometimes the use of the word soft kind of underplays the value that they can bring. Mm. But mm. The, those human skills, that ability to work with people and work on empathy and critical thinking skills and emotional intelligence and diversity and remote working capabilities, they are critically important for any organization to make the most of its technical skills. And it's the two of them together that really drive value. Mm. And I just, uh, I want to go back, speaking of which, to uh, something that you mentioned slightly earlier on, which is the the fact that the UK is, uh, I guess, falling behind uh, a little bit when it comes to some of those more human-centric skills like HR and communication. Mm -hmm. uh, so they were kind of some of the some of the lowest scores in terms of kind of core business skills. Um, how big of a problem is this for the UK in general and for UK based organizations specifically, you know, when we look at kind of competing in a global marketplace, both for talent and for uh, customers? It, it's going to become a challenge and I think it's going to become an increasing challenge for organizations in the sense that if you look at the UK on business skills, right, we, we're ranked 35th in Europe. And so that's quite a long way off given the size of the economy mm. and the investments we make in our education programs and, and everything else. We would hope that we'd be a little bit higher up in the rankings than that <laughs> and, and ideally near the top. Now, as you go into a, uh, an environment where it's more remote working orientated, you really don't need to be resident in the country. And you really don't mm. need, you could really work from anywhere. I mean, there's time zone considerations to take account of, but if you look across Europe, I mean, really you've only got a couple of hours of time zone, it's pretty easy to manage workforces across Europe. Mm. So you start opening up competition, which means highly skilled UK workers could be working for French or German firms, and German and French firms could, of course, be hiring highly skilled workers who are going to stay working from home in the UK. There's nothing stopping that happen other than the normal politics, legislation, all the fun and games that come with that. But from a purely mm. global access to talent, the world's going to open up because we can theoretically work from anywhere, and it's going to be, be based on the talent of those individuals. Now, if individuals mm. themselves, if they want to progress in their career and they want to develop their skill sets and create promotion opportunities and so on, you know, they need to have the opportunity to both develop the skill sets and to work for organizations where those opportunities will be fostered. And in most cases, that's going to happen where companies are able to thrive and to outperform their competitors, which allows them to grow and create those opportunities. So the best companies will attract the best skill sets. And if those best companies are not in the UK, then our best talent is likely to go and look for work outside. And that then becomes obviously a vicious declining circle um, if we get mm. into that situation. Mm. So we want to make sure that we are competitive um, in the UK as an overall workforce and having the skill sets that are available to us. We also want to make sure that we are 
creating skill sets that we know are going to be much more important in the future. Um, not just so that we can stay competitive, but there's a real serious risk that for large parts of the population, that we don't give people the opportunity to reskill, that the skill sets they have today will no longer be relevant in the world of work, and their current role will be automated out of existence, at least in part, if not in full, by advances in technology and machine learning and AI and so on. And that creates a problem then for the government, because if you have a lot of individuals who don't have the skills that businesses are looking for, they are much less likely to be employed or are much less likely to earn um, the money that they could potentially earn, which either reduces tax revenue or it increases the amount of benefits provision we have to provide for people who are able to secure work, none of which is particularly positive for the economy. So <laughs> if we can create a strong skills landscape where UK-based working people have a great skills profile and it's future-orientated skills as well, and we have good digital and data literacy skills, good technical capabilities, and strong human skills that work in the way the world of work is going today, it puts individuals in a strong place to succeed, and it gives in, and businesses a great talent pool to ensure that they can thrive competitively on the world stage. And skills underlies all of that. Skills and technology are the fundamental components for any organization to be able to competitively outperform its peer group. So we've spoken like mainly really about uh, you know, the kind of human centric skills. The report does also look at the UK's level of proficiency in technical skills. How mm -hmm. competitive are we in terms of technical aptitude? Well, we do better on technology compared to business skills. So on the global stage, and when we say globally, again, we're looking at 108 of the world's countries. Mm -hmm. um, we were uh, number 77 globally, and we were number 35 in Europe. On technology, we're 47 globally. So we're considerably higher up, mm -hmm. um, 29 in Europe. And you, so you can see the difference in Europe isn't quite as much. And that's because Europe actually generally is pretty good in technical skills. Um, and then there's a subset of technolo um, um, technology, uh, which is around data science. And mm -hmm. we, we, we call this its own category because it's such a clear area of focus for so many companies. And in that, we actually are the best of those three major domains, business tech and data science. Data science, we're number 34 globally, and we're number 24 in Europe. So when we look at these categories, you know, we sort of look at people who are perhaps emerging and uh, country level skill sets, which are, say, competitive. And then you could go into leading edge. We're not leading, but mm -hmm. we do have enough skill sets to be competitive. There's still a lot of work we could do to improve that position. Mm. That surprises me a bit on data science because it's it, it's good that we're doing well. Um, but given that um, financial services is such a strong element of our economy, and you know, when mm -hmm. I think about data science, that is obviously one of the places where it's important. I'm surprised that we are you know, being competitive, but not actually you know, kind of within the top 10 in some ways. Yeah, and uh, that's, again, obviously where we would love to be. And if you look at um, you know, financial skills specifically, we do do very well on that, mm -hmm. uh, in, in, finance, in finance and that specific uh, element. But it's only one of the industry sectors that we work in. And data skills, data science skills, um, data analysis, et cetera, it, it is relevant to every single industry. And mm -hmm. it's not just relative uh, in the sense of a company needs to have a data science team and maybe it's 10 or 20 people who are really looking at data in a very detailed way. Data literacy skills and really understanding what is data about? What is the value to the company? Why does it matter? How do we use it? What do we do with it? It's relevant to marketing teams. Like how do we use data on our consumers and our customers to make sure that we're running campaigns that really work effectively with them? And how do we actually test and model the effect of those to determine our marketing strategy? On sales teams, do you, what, what data do we have that tells us how we're working? Where can we improve our conversion rates and improve our sales performance and make sure that we have the right approach? On looking at product, how do we look at our product market fit and how that works with our, our consumers and end users? So every single function in a business needs to have some capability to leverage data 
to drive the best possible performance, as well as a very deep level analysis that perhaps goes company wide for a data science team. Mm. And so you'll see data skills they're needed in manufacturers, in retailers, in financial institutions, and even in government departments. You know, you need data across every single industry function. And what you may well find even in a financial organization is they may have some very strong financial skills and understanding financial instruments and how to actually sell those products. It doesn't necessarily mean they're also fantastic at data oriented skills, but there's a clear opportunity to leverage data to continue to improve their competitive advantage. Mm-hmm. But I think it's because we see that aggregating averaging effect across the whole of the economy. And it's become something that almost every corporate organization I talk to is actively recruiting for data science, data analysis, data type skill sets. And there's simply not enough supply in the marketplace. So they've mm-hmm. become very hard to recruit for those roles. Even if you do manage to recruit them, retain them can be extremely difficult. And you need to invest constantly in those roles to make sure they're feeling they're being developed and having opportunities to grow. Otherwise they'll simply go to another organization. Mm-hmm. And so there's a supply demand problem and there's an investment and in skills problem. There's also a challenge for many organizations to understand What is the value of data? Like, how do I measure the business case? How do I justify investment in big data skilling programs? Yeah. Or building data literacy across my whole organization. It's very difficult to kind of say, well, that's going to deliver me X amount of revenue or growth. It's a hard thing to quantify. And that also, I think, creates a reticence sometimes for organizations to invest as much as they could in data skills, even though there's a kind of inbuilt recognition that is super valuable it's just hard to define what that value really is so we've spoken about some of the more uh human-centric skills uh as well as the technical skills uh including data science that are going to be increasingly in demand by businesses where should businesses be putting their focus in terms of learning and development because obviously it's it's it can be difficult to balance both of those things at the same time and there's occasionally a tendency to go for the kind of quote unquote shinier uh, aspects of things like data science and mm-hmm. whatnot than the slightly more you know not to put too far in a point on it slightly more boring side of kind of hr and communications and some of the some of the some of the fundamentals as it were mm-hmm. And, and you're right, it's, it's very easy to kind of focus on specific areas of skills and particularly the ones where you can see an obvious need and a, a very definable area of focus uh, in terms of building mm. those skills propositions. But it is really just addressing one part of the puzzle. And we do need to look at it holistically. The challenge that you find in most organizations, certainly any organization of scale, is that you'll have multiple functions and you'll often have a central team that's trying to figure out how to do learning for the company overall. And if you're a central team, you generally don't have the detailed knowledge of the skills required and how those functions work because that's not your area of specialism. And so you're likely to go out to look at the marketplace and just try and find something that's kind of as broad and wide as possible, which may or may not meet the learning needs because it's just a catalog of options to, to access. Similarly, on the functional side, often the individual teams are frustrated with what's available centrally because it doesn't necessarily meet their needs and they don't have that understanding. So I think the core of this is not so much about trying to find uh, things for people that you can access for learning. It's really about defining what's critical for a role. So when we look at an organization and you look at a particular role, and they could be in the data science team, they could be in sales, they could be managers, they could be supply chain operatives. What are the skill sets that are needed across both technical data and, of course, human skill domains that make that role as effective as possible? What are the, the ideal skill sets that allow them both to perform the role itself and to work cross-functionally with other related functions and their peers? And then having, de- having looked at the role requirements, we can build specific sets of skills that are gonna enable that role to be successful. And then by defining it in the skills that are required across the organization and how those skills are to relate with each other, you can then identify and build the learning programs that support creation or upskilling to enable those roles to be as effective as possible. And that isn't about piecemeal picking things. It is about looking holistically across the skills landscape. 
the the positive benefit of doing it in a holistic approach by looking at it across all the different roles and the skill sets is it helps organization identify where there are transferable skills and commonality in skills which improves the ability for to people to be able to move around in the organization to have what we'd call internal mobility where people can go from a sales job to a marketing job or from a finance role to a data science role because there are going to be some core skills human skills often go across multiple capability sets and you can actually build technical skill proficiency relatively quickly we've seen that people um, again through our report who are looking at doing say mid career changes that they can develop entry level digital skills jobs in anything from say about 35 to 70 hours of learning so it's not a huge amount i mean that's you know if you could put 10 hours of learning in per week which is certainly um, possible one to two months of effort and you could build enough technical skills to move into a, a new role in the digital or tech oriented world and then, of course, you're leveraging the human skills and other transferable skills that you already have uh, to make that happen. And we're seeing more companies trying to facilitate that because it's so difficult to find the high demand skills in the open market. that if you can create an environment where people can reskill internally and you create programs for that to happen and visibility into the skills needed, you avoid a lot of those challenges in competing in the open market and you avoid having to make lots of people redundant because their skill sets are no longer valuable because you give them as an opportunity to develop. That's a great cultural focus. It helps also ensure that your people are staying loyal to you. It reduces a lot of hiring risk, but most importantly, it drives better business outcomes and it helps you thrive competitively. Mm -hmm. There is a big focus, obviously, we've talked about the value of skills in the sense of it can help organizations, can help individuals with career choices. There's another part about skills, which is more about the broader sense of education. When you create people with great skill sets and education, you create opportunities. Education also has a very powerful transformative effect on the world. It's, it's probably one of the greatest forces for good that exists. And through developing knowledge and skill sets, creating options, creating flexibility, it leads to a more positive society. It leads to more opportunity, it leads to more flexibility, it means to greater adaptability. And what we've seen is that organizations that really focus on giving individuals the opportunity to develop, to progress, to have the skill sets that will really lead to improved business outcomes, the brand perception of those organizations is very positively impacted. And you see that in then when people are looking for companies to work for and the reasons why they say they want to join, it's often becomes a much bigger focus on the opportunity to really connect what I do with the outcomes of the company. It's the development opportunity. It's the opportunity to reskill and have flexibility in my career. So just focusing on it is something that can help amplify the brand and create more talent attraction as well as leading to those competitive outcomes. So I think it's something that if governments, if educational institutions and corporations all get behind the overall skills agenda, it's a very, very positive thing for society as a whole. Well, unfortunately, that's all we have time for this week. But thank you once again to Coursera's Anthony Tattersall for joining us. You can find links to all of the topics we've spoken about today in the show notes and even more on our website, itpro.go.uk. You can also follow us on Twitter, where we're at ITPro, as well as Facebook and LinkedIn. Don't forget to subscribe to the IT Pro podcast wherever you find podcasts to never miss an episode. And we'll be back next week with more analysis from the world of IT. Until then, goodbye. Bye. The IT Pro Podcast is brought to you by the Dennis Podcast Network.